I would like to invite Katrien Boom. Uh, Katrien is a London-based artist, but grew up in a small uh, place on the countryside. And that has an influence on her work as an artist. She uses social and artistic methods to relate to the ever-changing human relationship with the urban and rural practices. She's one of the founders of an international group called My Villages. Um, well, actually, we're three artists together, all based in big cities, but grew up in tiny uh, villages. And for them, the countryside is a space for cultural um, production. She calls herself a public realm artist, or an artist whose work produces and nurtures the public space. And I expect that uh, during her talk, she, makes, she will make this a little bit more clear. Um, Catherine, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Um, hello, thanks so much for the invitation. It's an incredible pleasure being here. Um, now, I have a task because I have a microphone. I have this. And I was going to use an object um, to do my talk. Um, so let's see how it goes. Yeah, I might have to chuckle this. You need, um, you need me to hold your mic, maybe? Maybe for a while. Yes. Or do the slides. Yeah, for, for, for a while. Yeah, sure. Or you can hold this. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk, I have five points, they're hidden, if you find them, you get, you get this object. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the urbanizing the rural, I think what you started already um, in your presentation. Um, so one point would be to, once in a while, take, take off your urban lens, try to look at the countryside without too many urban assumptions um, around it. Um, and then... I think what we've already discovering is this kind of high, highly problematic identifying of what is rural and what is the countryside and what is urban. And we of course all know that it's completely impossible, which doesn't mean um, that we shouldn't make an effort to look at rural particularities because they still exist. But I think we probably have to look careful and we probably have to change perspective. We definitely have to take off the urban lens and uh, maybe listen to voices we normally don't listen to. Um, so this is just a kind of um, um, thought ex exercise that whether we can disconnect the rural from, from its geography, the countryside, and then also quite instantly not get trapped in like, when we close our eyes and imagine the countryside, see fields and cows and sunshine. Just kind of disconnect the rural from our imagined um, 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 countryside. Um, but I think it's also, and it's in the title, and that's, that's a dilemma we all struggle with, is so you want to identify something, you want to pay attention to it, you don't want to define it, and at the same time you don't want to reinstate existing hierarchies, um, like between the city and the periphery, there, there is a hierarchy in language, um, the center and the, the, the hinterland, um, um, the metropolis and the province, so I think just to be quite careful with... Um, also the reproduction of, of, of hierarchies and power relationships um, in using those, those words. And now I need water as well. I need four hands. <laughs> um, the next image is exciting. It's a village. Um, I'm going to use this object to do a little bit also what, what you have done in your presentation to kind of deconstruct our idea of what the rural looks like, what it does, um, its problematics, its dynamics, its positives and so on. Um, I have to be very honest, this is my home village three years ago, no, a um, hundred years ago and it has just undergone um, a kind of rural gentrification program which was very resisted by the villagers because, it, of course, it came top down. Someone decided um, how a village should look like today. And there was real protest in the village, and they had signs up saying, like, this village has never been beautiful. Why now? And I thought it was such, you know, such a sharp analysis. Anyway, so there was talk about making villages traditional again. They got rid of the um, 1950s tarmac and have some fake gothic cobblestone now. Whereas this, this would have been authentic, but no one dares going there. 
Um, so yeah, I think one of the points is, I think I come from an arts context, um, art, and I think architecture as well, there's always a tendency of like avant-garding the next thing. So yeah, like, I, know, I hear people in the art world saying, oh, the rural is the new queer. And you're like, oh, please don't. <laughs> or, you know, like, black is the new black. Um, I think in architecture as well, the rural is a new frontier. No, that's where we're going to have to go next. That's where, where we are needed. So I think there's a little bit of danger to this, to this attitude. And as I said earlier, there's an urgency, but maybe the urgency is more to hold and to pay attention and to ask ourselves, who, what do we look at? Who, who, who do we ask? How do we develop proposals? Um, so with my object, oh, where is it? Um, I thought I'd just introduce a few terms, um, which, which we use a lot when we work in the rural in rural communities, um, one is the local, a very kind of um, important term I think when it comes to rural. At the same time, highly problematic, can be very exclusive. If if you're not from there, you have no voice. Um, but also like a weird idea of what a local identity is. You know, like oh, we had a brick factory. Yeah, every other village on this globe had one that had clay. Um, so there's there's sometimes a bit of a misunderstanding over the local versus the universal, but I think it's still a good starting point um, when you start working and talking um, to rural communities. Um, the non-local, um, how does that relate? The translocal is a term we use quite a lot in our, our work, also to avoid a certain language around the center and distribution into the, into the periphery. Can we think of like translocal networks, um, the transnational, um, Often uh, um, rural um, areas are more organized in terms of regions who often have more similarities to another region in another country than in their own country. Um, the international, I'm going to have some very good examples. And the national, I think, um, because the rural is so much defined through um, land ownership, the national specifics are still very, very different. So we all think, oh yeah, we know how it works works completely different in Russia, China, everywhere. So there's still a huge kind of national specificity uh, when it comes to how the countryside um, and the rural actually works. Now, um, this is a new rural product. Um, it's a bestseller in our international village shop. No, I'm getting lost. Wait. Ugh. Next slide. And it's been developed with a group of women. And I have to be honest, this is my home village. I don't always work in my home village, sometimes I do, which of course has the advantage that I'm the local artist and they take part in my art project because I take part in their things. Um, there's a kind of obligation um, <clears throat> why we do this. No, that only works in my village. No, no one else and nowhere else. So um, I kind of started a conversation um, with the women around, um, let's think about cu cultural production, let's think about innovation, let's think about what you as women, women do. Um, how, how, when are you public? How are you public? And what public voice do you, do you get or want or take? Um, so the, the idea or the proposal was to invent a new product together. Um, of course, um, responding, the response was like, why? Which, which I think is a very good question. Yeah? Like, why should we in, um, in, in, um, invent yet another new product? But of course, the, the idea of inventing a product together was to have a collective discussion, a group discussion around what is local, what are resources, what are ideas, what are skills, um, but what, what is also kind of possibly a collective identity that we want to tell again and to, to reproduce. Um, so yeah, rural women, you know, that's, that's a very... The, the gendered view on the rural is very interesting, uh, with women normally being pushed out of the agricultural economies and into a lot more domestic economies. Um, women often, since the countryside has a tendency to be more conservative, have less of a pu public profile, have less of a role in representing what, what rural life is. Um, but also in terms of production, when I, when I spoke to my woman, uh, the women in my village, I am a woman of my village myself, um, I said, um, do you really always just want to make jam and cakes? Can't we, can't we do something else? And then slowly, slowly, we got towards a new product. Now I'm running out of time. 
That's the village. Very German. <laughs> like rendered to death. Um, oh, that's the road before they made it all nice. So now it's nice. Um, so we kind of started with a public discussion. The women meet once a month around what, what's there. And I think their initial response was, which also maybe the response of many is, that there is very little. It's a kind of post-agricultural uh, um, society, community, and no one feels anything particularly interesting is happening. And I think in terms of taking off the urban lens, that's one of the things we really have to force ourselves to do when we look at the rural, to, to not assume too fast nothing is there, to like really take time and dig a little bit deeper and, and use also methodologies to like talk, talk about this. Uh, in my case, it was uh, sheer force, for, force in person, to make long lists. Yeah, so this assumption of there's nothing here um, shouldn't be accepted. Um, we did workshops, not using language, using objects, um, to, to, to think about what this new product could be. And, and I mean, that was a methodology where, because the women really don't like talking too much about ideas, but rather handle something and do something and show something, um, worked relatively well. Um, there was suddenly that story of the, the village are called the frogs because there were many frogs. N not exactly important, but everybody knows the villagers as the frogs. Um, and someone told a story of the frog, a fable of a frog falling into a um, pot of cream and drowning. So I had to swim um, until the cream turns into butter. Um, the frog can like step onto the butter and escape. And now the object explains itself. And then, before I explain this, we also looked at, like, a lot of the women worked in manufacturing industries. There were, there's a huge porcelain um, manufacturing uh, history in the area, which most of it has been uh, moved to, to Asia. Um, but a lot of them, once they didn't work in ag agriculture anymore, had those kind of little shops to earn a bit of money. And porcelain um, manufacturing was one of them. So we had the frog story, we had the butter, we had the frog... <coughs> footprint and we had porcelain, very good connections to the porcelain. Um, so that was the new product. One condition was that it had to be useful, which I think still in terms of a rural identity, there is something about it has to be useful, which com is completely questionable, you know, like how many useful things do you have in your house that you never use? I mean, um, so anyway, so we have three functions in this um, new object, which is um, Obviously a spoon to take off the cream of the milk, um, a knife to butter your bread, and a very important frog footprint to make it local. <laughs> um, I quickly wanted to talk also, like again, when we talk about the rural economies, I think it's still interesting to see how rural communities often have a kind of more non-monetary economy that's still functioning. So in the case of the frog butter, frog, bu frog butter spoon, um, it was my mother's first boyfriend who later became a became porcelain um, engineer. So, you know, you get your stuff done because you ring someone. Um, doesn't work in the city, does it? <laughs> nah, you pay for it. Um, but also there was a big economy of like hosting and making cakes and making really nice cakes. And again, I think, yeah, this idea of Diverse economies around rural um, communities is really interesting. Um, so we made that spoon um, again. People were not, the rumor got around the man in the pub that the women were doing something, and they were doing something in porcelain, so like high production value. Um, we then launched it at the village fair at a shop. Everyone was like, yeah, no one's going to buy this. I'm like, I don't think so. And then we had a big discussion around value. And I think, again, this discussion around value is a really important one um, within the rural it's not just about agricultural production, it's a production of like culture, values, what, what should get reproduced, what is worth trading. Um, some of them are monetary. So when it came to the spoon, I was like, yeah, no, 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 we have to sell it for like a euro. You know, suddenly the whole countryside is like seriously deprived and no one has money. And you're like, no, come on, guys. It's like, let's sell it for 10 euros because that's what everybody buys for, pays for their schnitzel in the local pub. And of course it's sold out because everybody wanted the new local product. Um, so this idea of common goods and new common goods um, that are not necessarily monetary or commercial 
is quite a, a, a constant um, idea we use in our work when we work with rural communities because it touches on production, it touches on community, collective resources and possibilities, innovation. Um, so we do those shops and in those shops um, are those new products. Um, but also products from elsewhere. That's where the international comes in. The village can be suffocating. You know, there's a reason why we leave the village, because you do it a certain way, and if you don't like it, you shut up or go. Which, but then it's worth coming back and seeing, well, maybe how 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 can we also subvert a certain cultural monoculture in the countryside? Um, so with those shops, we have international products, and then everyone's really interested in like the Frisian. Um, um, horse milk um, cream, and suddenly you have a completely different discussion. And what I said earlier, the idea of like a translocal. Suddenly you compare what you do here to another village, and so on. And that's with like non-art audiences. That's just whoever lives in the village. And I just quickly so, uh, say about my villages, and it's going to be the next part. How many times? How much time do I have? Five minutes? No. Uh, okay, so my village is it's three of three of us, um, three artists who by default ended up in a, not by default, but because we wanted to study, study art, you, you end up in in the village uh, in the in the city, and just critically asked ourselves why don't we consider our own villages like as places to to work with, but we also did a support network um, for each other. Um, so we started in two thousand three and have been working um, quite internationally in rural areas since then. Um, but now I have to go fast. I, I quickly um, wanted to show three, what I think are infrastructures. Um, since we are working as creatives or artists in the rural, there, there are no galleries, there are rarely curators, there is no in art infrastructure as such. So I think that's a kind of architectural question of like, what kind of cultural buildings do we imagine for the countryside? And do we want to import urban ones? Or can we work with the rural particular and develop um, rural typologies? Um, so one we work with is the International Village Shop, which you've seen. Um, so it's a, it's a platform for us to trade all those local collective goods from villages in other villages, but also in the art world. Um, so that's the spoon in a corner shop in a, a veterinary <coughs> clinic in Friesland. That's the corner shop. Um, that's the, we are from the art world, so they, they travel both into villages. Um, the previous slide was um, Tate Britain in London, uh, and recently an exhibition in China at the Times Museum. And yeah, my village is very proud of this. You know, that's great. But there's something quite, I think there's something really nice about a kind of international uh, rural. Um, we make films, I have to go faster now. And there's a website, it's not an online shop, the uh, website uh, just tells you what products we have and where the next shop is. Normally far away. Um, another infrastructure we ran for like two years was again trying to connect the work we do in rural communities with the art world, where we are also from, we are not just from a village. Um, this was a two year long exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Leipzig. And they kindly gave us a small building, which was enough for us, to run a two-year-long um, exhibition program. And every three months, um, we brought two villages together in this building. Um, that's a very architectural diagram. Um, so that was the role of this kind of museum infrastructure in relation to our network. Um, I have the book here if you want to have a look later. Um, but just to give an example, the woman from my home village came when we showed their products um, en masse. You know, good news to go to a museum, normally not, but in that case, yes, because you don't have to go to the museum as a tourist or someone from the village who's never been to a museum. You go there because you're a co-producer of this work. So it gives you a completely different role um, in a kind of art world context. And we had... Um, um, Queen Mother from Ekumfi Ekrafo, a small village we worked with in central Ghana, and they didn't have the resources to send 17 women, they sent their queen. Um, so there's an, ex there's an exhibition of d documentation and products from both places, but there's also a social program where, where those groups meet, which I think in an, in an art context is normally the artist or the architect who travels 
it's not the people you work with in all those remote areas. Which, again, I think in terms of a new internationalism, it's important that um, not just the busy ones travel. Um, another infrastructure we've been running um, for the last 10 years is a pan-European network of uh, mutual learning. So it connects um, small local projects in, I don't know, seven countries. Um, again, with the idea that um, we go to places, look at a local project, understand um, its local necessity, desire, ambition, but then uh, people from the other um, places travel there as well and come with ex um, inter external international input, which is not always wanted. But because it's mutual, it's fine. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorite um, photos, like haystack making in the suburbs of Paris. Um, that's the Rourbahn project, if you're interested in the world <coughs> urban, um, definitely um, something looking up. And I have the book here as well for um, what over the time became an economatic school. Not a formalized school, but a kind of informal network for translocal knowledge exchange. Um, and again, suddenly this idea there is nothing in a village to talk about, you know, is, is gone because there is enough to talk to. And in my village they were like, why would, why would anyone spend more than two hours here? I'm like, but let's, let's wait and see, you know, maybe, maybe it's interesting. But also by bringing international groups in, the few fore foreigners in the village suddenly felt like they're invited too. Suddenly it was an international event. So there's something also interesting. Um, that's uh, a group of um, US young farmers watching how uh, a horse gets uh, milked. A horse, and now very quickly, a, a fourth infrastructure um, we are running um, for kind of rural-urban um, um, relationship. It's a drinks company. It's based in East London. Now I was like, why East London? I have a very exciting map. Okay. So East London, obviously London was super weeny teeny. Um, there's an East End. I don't know if you know London working class neighborhood and people from the East End would go to Kent roughly between 1850 and 1950 in their tens of thousands to do hop picking. So you have cheap urban working class labor, you have an agriculture that needs pickers, so London just simply becomes the source um, for those pickers. What's interesting about this history of like hop picking from the East End to Kent is it's one of the few histories where an urban working class develops its own cultural narrative and, and history. It's normally not the case. It's the middle or upper classes who have country houses or go on holiday to France. Um, so this has, of course, all changed. London has become massive. It grew into the counties of Essex and Kent. So our new um, drinks company is based in Barking and Dagenham, which is um, outer London. Um, and I need this photo. That's fine. And uh, the invitation was that we go picking again, so that we pick up this kind of collective memory of hop picking and a kind of uh, rural practice um, within a completely changed uh, demographics and geography of Greater London. And the invitation was let's get picking again, let's see what we can pick. We don't have to go to the countryside, um, but also everybody can go picking. It's not just um, white um, uh, working class. So we're working with a very kind of cha changed de demographic and um, um, geography. And the whole idea of company drinks is, and the big difference to the picking days, is that we keep what we pick, we make drinks, we trade them, and feed them back into kind of an economic uh, circle and a production circle, with the idea that every step in the production line is, 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 is public. Yeah? So people can come picking, they can, can come branding, they can come drinking, reinvesting, discussing, and so on. Um, and then, yeah, so that's some of our picking trips. That's some actual hop pickers going picking again. Very exciting. Uh, not that it's, uh, it's not an efficient way of making drinks. Um, taking communities to fields and pick. People think like, oh, that's good. You have all those volunteers picking, so your drink, drinks must be much cheaper. Again, no one has an understanding of how the economy of, of food production works. Of course, that is not 
a cost-efficient way. But it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a cultural project where uh, the two words of the meaning, uh, the, the two meanings of the word company come together. This idea of like having a social, collective, productive space, but also thinking about economy, business, commerce, commodifying, um, and, and running. So every year we produce a drinks range. I have two here. Again, if you spotted my five points, the second person <laughs> gets a drink. Um, <laughs> and the labels simply describe where we pick. And suddenly, sometimes London looks incredibly rural. You know. um, I think I'm almost done. Yeah. I mean, the, the left one's a black iron soda. We go cleaning, which is quite an interesting a rural practice, the kind of harvesting after the commercial harvest has taken place. Um, and on the right hand side, it's the green hop tonic where we go hop, pick, hop picking with hop pickers and make a beer and a non-alcoholic drink. And that's trading them. Again, we trade them locally for a pound the bottle and we trade them in the art world for three pounds a bottle. Um, that's at Freeze Art Fair. And the bad, now everybody will remember this. It comes from Barking and Dagenham. Um, yeah. The C obviously stands for a lot of different meanings. I think the ambiguity of those projects is very important. Products are products, but they are also the embodiment of narratives, of identities. Um, they are a tool to talk about an area, about uh, a village, um, and yeah. So in terms of rural art spaces, just to come back to this kind of challenge, I think we have, if we think about cultural spaces for the rural, um, yeah, what do they look like? <laughs> and I like your pyramid, but please not. <laughs> um, but I think also, um, let's not jump too fast to conclusions that we can bring urban <coughs> models in, you know, we don't need Kunsthallen in the countryside. Um, how could those other infrastructures look like? Do they need to be built? Are they more kind of like social infrastructures? But they would need an investment, they need looking after, they need curating, exactly like any other um, cultural space. Um, so the question really is, is like who's building what when it comes to like the, the countryside? Um, and in terms of looking at rural communities, the idea of collaborative practices, social practices, and I think the reproduction of an architecture that that also reproduces a system. I mean, I think that was the question around the monoculture, the monoculture, like if you produce monoculture, you reproduce monoculture, which is potentially very dangerous. Um, so the, the idea that whatever we set up, the reproduction of it um, produces a system, which we either want or, or don't. Um, yeah, so if you can't see it right now, don't give up. Um, let's be innovative, let's think also in a joyful way of, of how the countryside can be worked with differently, who we work with in the countryside and what kind of proposals we can come up with. I think we have to do this together. Um, I think just to impose ideas on the countryside will re reinfor re um, reinforce this idea that the city manages the countryside and therefore it's Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, could you uh, join me? Uh, could you have a seat? Um, so thank you very much. Um, it's actually extremely heartwarming as well. Um, before we called you accidentally a community artist. Really sorry for that. Um, but, sorry. But, but could you? It has to do with the context. Yeah, could you explain us what the. Because I don't actually know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, I mean, I, I work with communities. I think that's become clear. The members from the community have different roles in this collaboration. Yeah? Some become co authors, partners, visitors. So, just to differentiate the, what the work with someone can look like, mm -hmm. there's many different roles. Um, but I think in a context of here where we, where we think about spatial production, there's a danger that this kind of practice that looks quite social is only read as social. It's almost like a social front. And at, at least in the art context, that's where then the analy analysis stops. Yeah? So people think of um, social cohesion 
and bringing different groups together and having a nice chat, but it's not analyzed and looked at in terms of like uh, uh, spatial production, the production of like a social space, uh, maybe a space that turns into like a built space. Or, so that, that was the reason for it in this particular context to, to be clear that my work is actually more concerned with like public realm and public space and keeping it complex rather than organizing social events. But they're of course part of keeping the social uh, the public space complex. But yeah, so it's also a, a reflexive, um, there is a reflexive component in it that makes it... Um, so a community artist would be like bringing the community together and maybe the result is not super important because it's more about mm -hmm. the process. And here this reflexive, um, this, this, this re reflexive reflex um, is actually also an important part mm -hmm. of the work, yes. Um, I didn't guess the five points, wait, I'm so, sorry I can't. I, oh, I have to take my spoon home. <laughs> <laughs> what was it saying? Um, so, but how, how do you think your interpretation of uh, the beyond the urban is different than, for example, Stefan's? I think you see maybe a more historic component in it? Or? Uh, is I, there th a I think it is different practices. I, I don't think there's like one excludes the other. You know, I think it's uh, it's a bit like the rural, like let's let's see what different practices are there and how they actually can work together and inform each other rather than just emphasizing one. Um, of course, you work on a different scale, you work towards a different um, remit with this big um, exhibition. Um, um, I think our work normally starts with the one-to-one, -one, you know, it starts on the scale of a community, with a community, always with the ambition to produce something, whatever is possible, that it's tangible, mm -hmm. whether it's the spoon or a shop or an event. So that's the, the production of an actual event that translates the ideas into something we can all experience is always quite important. And maybe that might be a uh, dif difference in practice, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. How do you choose the communities you're working with? Um, uh, um, but we get invited. Okay. I think people Google like <laughs> Google like rural art. No, no not really. Oh, really? Uh, but they kind of know my villages and then yeah. uh, there is, there is a lot taking place in villages worldwide, culturally. It's not very networked. But once you are in a certain network, you will know others who do like a commissioning scheme in Northern Ireland or work in villages in Russia. So there's a network of, of rural practitioners and through that we quite often get invited. No? So it is actually the, the village that invites you, it's not the curator that, that it's implements sometimes it's you. It's a village oh, yeah. or a, not always an art connection to the village. No. I think I heard uh, that you will be doing a, an exhibition in Whitechapel Gallery? No, we're not, <laughs> not yet, no. Um, oh. We are, no, <laughs> let's not compete with the Guggenheim. No, we're not doing exhibitions. <laughs> and we did our International Village show, we are done. Uh, no, no, but the Whitechapel is, um, they're organizing a big conference on the rural next year. Mm -hmm. And there's a small working group and we are, we are on this working group. And of course, it's a very interesting discussion. A bit like you organized this evening, how do you organize a public discussion with a mainly urban audience around yeah. this topic? Yeah, I, I think, I'm not sure if it was on a slide that maybe went quite quickly, but um, I was thinking, oh, so, so is it actually also putting a, a very big magnifying glass on the rural? And maybe sometimes, um, I, I read a word, um, utilizing mm. the rural. Could you maybe expand on that? Is there a danger? In, in utilizing the, the rural or? I think within, within the art to a certain degree, just in this terms of like the next new story, you know, you just use it as the next new story. Yeah, like the new... Uh, uh, the new queer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think um, the, the, the rural has always been there, you know, it's also a slightly um, kind of imper imperialistic idea that we suddenly discover it. Yeah, it's been there. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. been there forever, and everybody who lives there has very deep and long thoughts about what it is and what they do there. So it's a place of knowledge, of immense knowledge. Um, so I think it was just about pointing out this danger of assuming it's something that needs solutions and not stopping enough and looking in it, paying attention to 
something that needs to be fixed. Yeah. The rural, yeah. That's something that is lacking something. It does, probably. I think most situations do. Okay. But I think just a careful, careful <coughs> analysis. Are there any questions for Katrin? Then actually, my question is, um, the, this carefulness that you're talking about, is there a way that you, um, um, yeah, not utilizing or you're checking yourself not, you, not to utilize uh, this village or mm. this, this rural area? Yeah, I think that care really has to do with like the role others are allowed to have in the process. And the village, uh, Spishi, uh, we worked with, Babke worked with for months and months and months in Russia. And they're part of this Nikolai, nah, Nikolai did -dim, -dim, dim sculpture park, Nikolai. Anyway, this mega massive sculpture park in Russia. Um, obviously, um, and there's a village, and this village gets exclusively used with their amazing skills to produce all the artwork for the artists. No one has ever thought about maybe working with the villagers mm. other than using them and their skills to produce, again, an idea that's imported into the countryside. So I think the roles we allow us all to have in the discussion it's about the rural, it's quite important. Not just using local no uh, rural knowledge, not just using skills we have lost in the cities. You feel responsible for um, the people you work with or the... Well, I mean, I think that has, that's not really rural specific, you know, like I think in our work we normally try to have, have this mutual agreement over everybody benefits from the situation. Yeah, um, so from yeah. the spoons. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, Wiede has been drawing and oh, I yeah. see some kind of... That's, yeah. right. that's the tyranny of the local. <laughs> no, this is the rural. Ah. So, yeah. The rural is lonely. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I was surprised uh, when you talked. I, f I felt uh, also uh, talked at because my job is thinking in uh, cliches. And what you talked about the rule, when you talked about the rule, you, you specifically asked not to think in cliches. So, yeah, the, my job was done for the night, I thought. Uh, but I tried anyway. So, yeah, grow my seeds and then a spoon. Uh, nothing here. Uh, what I liked is, uh, like Stefan, the, 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 the last talk, the bringing the rural in the city. So yeah, the hot big pockets in the city. And, uh, so. and what was what's the text beneath? Oh, it, uh, it's hop big pockets in the city. So mm -hmm. you got to keep your hop safe. <laughs> um, I like the community. Or, or, although you said it's not a community, that you're not a community artist, but the, the togetherness of people coming together from rural things, then there is no spoon, a uh, little bit of the matrix, uh, <laughs> like the idea, I'm sorry if it's too much cliche, but yeah, that's my job. So yeah, take off your rural and urban lenses, I tried, but I think I failed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mide. Thank you, Catherine.